Welcome back. Uh, so this is the second uh, topic in modern operating systems. Uh, as a reminder, all of the course materials are available online at https uh, wills.co.tt slash os. Today we'll be talking about system calls and the system call interface. So let's, let's start with thinking about where this fits in. And the basic place that we want to look at is what a process is. So processes are something that we probably all interacted with already. This is the application, the, the user programs. So your web browser, the programs you're writing, and the various utilities that are running on the computer. And we talked already in the last uh, lecture about this role of an illusionist that the operating system is playing where we have this simpler interface that an application is going to be uh, written against that doesn't have to deal with the actual hardware and there's this translation uh, or illusion that the operating system is doing and we put that translation in a place called the kernel okay so you've got the operating system kernel that is this higher privileged uh, piece of code that's going to intermediate and, and be able to then have these lower permissioned individual applications and both act as that referee thing where it, it manages the resources between them and the applications can't escape and, and manage their own resources and then also provides this nice illusion uh, that, that makes it easier for us to write these individual apps or processes, okay? And so as we start thinking about this interface between the application and the kernel, uh, which is the system call interface, the, the interface for how I make a call down to the system into the kernel. Um, we've got a couple questions that we're going to basically focus on in, in, in the next hour and a half, so, so this and the next uh, video. The first thing is, how does an application safely make requests to the operating system? And so we'll spend a little of time going into the mechanism uh, for, I've got an application, What's the actual means by which my code starts triggering code that then runs in this higher privilege in the kernel? So, so I've got a request, I've got something I need to do, and I need the operating system to do it on my behalf because I don't have permission as the application to do it. And so we need to work through the process where this actually happens. Okay. So let me give you some examples to, to help motivate this, this thing, this concept of the application needing the operating system to do something on its behalf, okay? So there's a bunch, uh, here's some examples. So read, write, open, close. These are file system things, right? So I want to open a file, I want to read from it, I want to write back to it. Because as an application, I can't access the hard drive, the disk, this device connected to the computer directly, I need to go through the operating system to do that for me, okay? And so these are the standardized POSIX, uh, calls. So POSIX is what we're going to call this set of system calls uh, in Linux, but there's equivalents anywhere else that I'm going to actually use to, to interact with my operating system. Okay. And so if you've uh, written code in C or C++, you may have seen calls or, or functions that exist that look pretty much like this. Um, so uh, the, in C, you actually can directly make open and read and write calls. Uh, typically there's a library that will give you uh, maybe a, a little bit easier to interact with things. So um, you might have an F open where you get back a file descriptor uh, variable. Um, and, and, so there, and, and what that is doing is it's taking some code that will run in your application uh, that, that converts from the actual system call that you'll be making to the operating system back with some sort of convenience glue to the interface that you might expect as a programmer. So um, you'll have uh, F read, F write, and these things are fairly standard uh, interface that you might code against in, in a C or C++ world. If you're in Java, you're going to have a fairly different set of calls that you'll make. And again, the Java runtime, this application, is going to convert from those down to these lower level uh, system calls. So read, write, open, close, these are you know a basic subset, and there's a lot more for interacting with files. That's one place where we're going to need to interact with the operating system. We've got a set of things around mm, 
a fork is a process management. So, so if I and, and we'll we'll get to that in later lectures. What what this is? It's a, one of the core uh, system calls that I'll use to to start running new programs. Uh, mount. If I want to uh, connect a new disk, uh, I need to ask the kernel to do that, and someone has to ask the kernel to do that. Uh, make dir. So my so another file system thing that's at a higher level. How do I change you know these things and make new directories? Select. Um, is a more complex call that you might use if they've got a bunch of different events that might happen. So uh, I'm waiting either for a network uh, packet to, to show up, so, so something might happen, or I'm waiting for uh, you know, the user to um, type something on the keyboard. Select helps me say, uh, here's a list of things that might happen. Uh, tell me when the first one does happen. Um, things like sleep. I want to wait a little bit of time and then I want my program to start running again. This is something that the program doesn't have the ability to like directly have an instruction to do that. It goes to the operating system and asks for that uh, functionality. Um, stepping back a little bit, um, there's probably five or six types of system calls if we wanted to try and classify these at a high level. Um, there's not really a single like, like if you were to look in the Linux kernel uh, code, you're not going to find the system calls classified in this way. But this is maybe a useful way to think about the bulk of them. Um, you've got a set of system calls around process controls. So that's going to be, I want to make a new process. I want to stop this process. I want to see what other processes I have access to. Uh, I want to send messages uh, to other processes. So that, that's a process control set of calls that the operating system is going to intermediate. We've got the file system, and so this is the, the open, close, read, write, make directories, remove directories, move directories around, move files around, right? So a lot of things around how I'm going to uh, interact with the file system as uh, in, in Linux and Unix-like systems, the file system is this point of interaction between applications, right? If I, if I want to uh, have my program you know, write a picture and have some other program then edit that picture, the file system is the way that we coordinate that. And so there's a bunch of stuff around, you know, interacting with this file system. Device manipulation. So if I need to interact with uh, the USB printer, if I need to interact with the mouse and uh, or the keyboard or the display, um, if I want to be writing pixels onto the display in an optimized way or uh, interact directly with the GPU to do, um, you know, parallelized computation or, or CUDA or these various uh, types of um, device-specific interactions, uh, I need to get permission from the operating system and then have the oper operating system help me set up and interact with those devices. Uh, as, a, as a user program, I don't have the permission to directly send messages to devices on the, on the computer. There's a set of things for learning system information. Um, so I might want to learn what time is it, what version is of the system is running so that I know how to interact with it correctly. Uh, so, so there's a set of things around this information gathering and like understanding what environment I'm in uh, and, and learning things about the, the kernel itself. And then finally, there's a set of things around communication. So sending, receiving messages, um, and, and this maybe goes into process control, but you're not controlling per se, but, but the actual receiving and sending of, of messages of various type uh, and that communication uh, would be a way to classify a subset of, of the system calls. Um, some attempts at classification also would say that there's a whole set of things around uh, permissions and uh, protections. So, um, you know, I would like to uh, s change the permissions on, you know, on some of my memory, on a file, uh, on other things. I think a lot of this can fall into these five, right? And and I think, you know, the way I think about this, these permission and security style uh, concepts um, really are part of how we would do any of these other five things. All of these five things come with a concept of well, who can do it and what permissions are associated with this. So, so I would bake that uh, more deeply into each of these five things. I think potentially communication also uh, would fall into the other four that, that you, don't, you wouldn't necessarily want to classify uh, communication as its own set of calls, uh, that they more naturally fit into these other things. Uh, okay, so there's a lot of system calls. Um, this is maybe a little bit old, but, but uh, you know, at least 350 uh, system calls in Linux. Um, 
so, so this has expanded a lot, uh, and, and we can certainly uh, ask why do we need so many? That seems like a lot of things uh, in terms of interaction points. Uh, and that's, that's true. Um, and, and we'll get in, in a little bit later in this lecture um, to some of the alternatives that maybe uh, allow us to have less. Um, but, but the reality of Linux right now is that there are a lot of system calls. Likely as a application developer, you will not use most of them. Uh, so there's a lot of system calls in Linux that are, well, certainly around some of these like device type things that you're not necessarily likely to be doing as an individual application, right? You, you don't need to set up a new USB device uh, in general. Um, and, and so large classes of these system calls are, are going to be things that you don't uh, interact with directly. And then beyond that, what you'll see is that there's a lot of system calls that are variations of the same call, uh, but with different arguments. So um, maybe I want to open a file, maybe I want to open a file with specific permissions, maybe I want to open a file with extended attributes, maybe I want to open a file with you know other options. Each of those might be a different system call. And so in fact, there's not a single open, but there's a class of maybe 10 open system calls within that 350. As, as an application, you're unlikely to directly see all 10 of those. What you'll see is the, the libc libraries presented fopen, and that will, based on the arguments you give it, choose one of these underlying uh, system calls. So the, the system call interface is hmm, has been made narrow, in a sense, in that it does not allow much um, ability for arguments to be either of different types or different lengths or uh, a different number of arguments. And, and as such, it's not very flexible. An individual system call uh, really is trying to uh, define a very singular action that, that you are requesting from the kernel. And so when you have a more general concept like opening a file, uh, depending on what file that is, you may find that that doesn't map to a single action that you might want from the kernel, but rather a range of uh, you know, five or 10 actions with different arguments depending on what's been passed in by the user and the context. Um, uh, and, and so uh, often what you'll see is the glue, the, this, this system library like libc that's running as part of your application, not, not before the, the system call, before the kernel. So it, it's up in the lower permission application space, not down in the uh, kernel uh, high permission space will translate from something that's more natural for your programming uh, language to these uh, system call interfaces. Um, this website, syscalls.kernelgrok, gives you a list of uh, all of the system calls uh, in Linux if you are interested in seeing and browsing through what these are. There's a lot of them. OK, I'm going to diverge just for a second and give a quick refresher on computer architecture. Um, because one of the things we need to think about is this is not uh, an interaction just between your program and the kernel, but it's mediated by the hardware, right? This is uh, code that is running uh, on a CPU, a physical chip, uh, and, and we should think about what that actually means to understand what it means to transition between these two uh, privilege levels. So very basic CPU. The CPU has uh, an instruction pointer. It's pointing to some instruction that it is going to run next. It has some state. So where we say registers, we're talking about these like local variables. So, uh, you know, if I've got a, a local variable in my C code uh, that I'm incrementing, likely that ends up, the compiler is going to uh, allocate a register. So one of these physical little places of memory in the CPU uh, will, will record that, you know, the variable I while, while it is relevant. Um, and then the CPU also has access to the, the broader set of memory in main memory. Uh, and, and so we'll use that uh, in order to um, be able to read and write all of the various other variables that aren't directly in this immediate uh, register space. Okay, so, so there's this local state, there's the local position that's getting executed. Um, we talked at the beginning about this separation between the application and the operating system. And one of the things that we'll see is that in general, we would like hardware support. So we would like there to be some functionality in the CPU uh, that, that helps us uh, actually define a difference when, for when we're running in a user program mode and when we're running in operating system kernel mode. Uh, and, and 
start thinking because the next thing I'm going to talk about is, well, what does that actually mean? What is it we need from the hardware? Um, okay, but, but in general, the, the CPU is going to run a piece of code and then from there, it's going to move to the next one. There's a special thing that looks sort of like a register, um, but, but another variable in the CPU called the program counter, and that is a pointer to the next instruction that is going to run. Okay. And so each time an instruction runs, that program counter increments to the next one. Uh, and some of the instructions, uh, like control flow instructions, so jumping somewhere else, are going to say, uh, are going to interact and change that program counter. They're going to move where uh, the CPU is executing uh, in memory. Okay. Cool. So we've got this very basic low level model for how a CPU works. Let's think about what we need if we want to have the separation between a user program that gets to do less and the kernel that's going to manage these user programs. So we need some concept of privileged instructions. So things that the kernel can do and, and when we run these instructions in the kernel, uh, we want those to work. And when we're up in an application, they, they probably shouldn't. So for instance, uh, you know, if I'm going to send a message or uh, otherwise interact with the hardware, that's something that we've said the kernel gets to do and the user program does not get to do. Uh, well, that means there has to be some actual instruction, some thing that the CPU is executing that, that triggers the CPU to go send the message out to the hardware out to the disk, out to the memory, out to the USB printer that gets to run when we're running in the kernel and that the CPU rejects and, and says, no, this isn't a valid context to run this when we're running as an application. We also have some concept of memory space safety, right? So a process gets to access its memory. So in an application, I've got my memory and I can access it. But I shouldn't be able to access the memory of the kernel. Because if I can read and write to the things in the kernel, I can corrupt it. Uh, and I shouldn't be able to read and write other processes and be able to mess with them. So we've got some sense of containment of there's some range, some space of memory that I as an application can access, and that's somehow different. So, so uh, there, there's some setting up and differentiation of memory between what is viewed by a application and what is viewed in the kernel. So kernel memory versus application memory. Uh, and we've got a series of lectures coming up where we dig deeper into that concept because that ends up being um, this hardware mediated uh, scheme that is done in different ways on different types of computers, but, but ends up uh, having a bit of complexity and is really at the heart of a lot of how you structure an operating system. Uh, and then finally, uh, we need to think about how the kernel regains control. So if I've got a program that goes into an infinite loop, it just keeps, you know, doing a for loop and incrementing a counter. Uh, does my whole computer just freeze and only do that? Uh, or is there a way for the operating system to quit that program and let me get back and do other things, right? It would be nice if uh, programs can't just seize control forever. And so we need to think about how, how am I going to schedule different programs? Uh, and how am I going to uh, have, you know, the CPU run a program for a little bit and then switch to running another program for a little bit. Um, and so this is another core job of the operating system is this concept of scheduling. Uh, and so we will also get into that, um, but we also need something from the hardware to help us with this. Okay, cool. So the focus today uh, is on system calls. Uh, and so this concept of how an application is going to interact uh, with the kernel. So what does a system call look like? Well, it is a architecture specific uh, call in general. And what that means is, uh, the instruction, the, the specific thing that I'm going to trigger the CPU to do, uh, well, that's based on what CPU I'm running. So if I'm running on a x86 PC or an i386, so this is uh, an Intel or AMD style desktop or laptop, um, the assembly, and this is x86 assembly, because your assembly, your, your actual instructions that you are going to have your CPU run are specific to that CPU, will look like interrupt int code 80. Um, in in 64-bit x86-64 architectures, so this is newer Intel PCs, uh, they have a larger range of instructions the CPU can execute, and there's a specific system call uh, instruction that you would run. On things like ARM, 
Um, so, so this is uh, a lot of cell phones, uh, smartphones will be using an ARM processor and many embedded devices will be using ARM. There's a system or there's an assembly instruction that the CPU recognizes called software interrupt, SWI, uh, and typically that just needs code zero. Okay, so we'll, we'll look uh, as we dig a little bit deeper into this at, at specifically the x86, the, the older desktop thing as, as a standard that, that you know, is a reasonable place to start uh, in your understanding of, of sort of how this architectural support works. So what is an interrupt, right? So an interrupt is maybe easiest to think of as a specific pin on the CPU where when some external device, the, the real-time clock, uh, the network card, the disk, uh, the keyboard and mouse, any of these bus activities of external devices uh, has an event that it needs the CPU to respond to. It sends a signal, an electrical current on that pin. And the CPU, this complex circuit, when it sees that the interrupt uh, has been triggered, it will jump to a specific piece of code. The program counter will change to an interrupt handler. So an interrupt handler uh, basically means right, returning to our, our diagram of the computer architecture, that the program counter is going to jump to some specific place that's defined in something called an interrupt handler or interrupt table, because often there are more than one place, uh, depending on the type of interrupt that's happened, that code might jump. The registers will need to get managed somehow, so the state the CPU is in will suddenly change. Okay, so it's suddenly in this responding to this external signal. And so essentially what all three of these instructions are doing in various ways is they're saying, I want to act like this interrupt thing from an external device has occurred. So, so I am saying that, hey, you know, respond in the same way that you would that some event has happened. Because typically what this interrupt handler is set up to do uh, by the kernel at the startup, as, as the system starts, is it's going to be a kernel function. So we're now going from code that's been running as the user to suddenly, oh, there's an interrupt, the kernel response, and now we're in kernel mode. So now we're in the higher privilege mode that's responding to an event. And one of the events that might have happened is a program wanted to make a system call. Right? And so uh, in x86, the you know code 80 is, oh, an event happened. What event happened? Well, event 80, which is a program wanted to make a system call. Cool. So what does this do? Well, it acts like a hardware code, right? And uh, code 80 in the case of, of x86, and you know it's a specific place to jump in the other two. Um, and it's going to act like this. It's, it's going to follow the same procedure. We're, we need to validate the user input. We need to make sure that the things that have been passed as the system call uh, are allowed, that you know the, the file you've asked to open, you have permission to open. Um, we need to, you know, understand, you know, that this input is valid input, that it's memory that is memory that the program set up and is allowed to access. We, we perform the requested task if it's allowed, and then we return back to the user program, right? This is, this is, you know, like any function, be it uh, in your program or in, in the kernel or whatever, you, you, it's a function. Uh, you, you get input, you make sure that input's you know, okay, you do the thing that you're asked to do, and you return, right? Like this is, this is what a function looks like. Cool. Um, okay, so how do we validate input? You know, is it possible with more than 350 of these that we're going to validate all of these without bugs? That's a big surface area, uh, and yet this is you know, an important question to think about because we've set this boundary as our permission boundary, right? This is the thing that separates unprivileged user code from this higher privileged kernel that's dealing with the actual hardware. And so we're saying, you know, the user can run whatever program they want, uh, but they're still running as a user. Uh, and so there's this boundary we've set up. And we're saying across these, you know, 350 or so system calls, you shouldn't be able to start running arbitrary code up at this higher permission level. Especially if you're not root. You're, you know, if I'm a normal user, I can make system calls. Uh, but that's not full control of the computer. 
but this is a fairly wide interface, right? Like this is this is maybe more function calls than a lot of things that we would define as our sort of security interface for for how we understand about elevating permissions. Um, and and in fact, we found that you know that is a very wide interface. So there continue to be uh, things called local privilege escalations. And what that means is there's some bug in this input handling of, or input validation of system calls that means that as a normal program, I can make system calls in a way that is unexpected or that has invalid input such that uh, I cause the operating system to allow something it shouldn't and in effect allow my program or, or this um, malicious process to somehow end up escalating its privileges to to be able to start operating at, with full control of the computer uh, rather than just uh, as a user program. Okay, so um, probably roughly, I don't know, yearly, uh, maybe a few times a year, we see local privilege escalation vulnerabilities still. Um, this, this is not uh, stopped. Cool. Um, Okay, so how we return back to a user program uh, is going to look sort of like the inverse. Uh, I've, I've encoded uh, what this x86 assembly looks like uh, on this slide. Uh, and, and really, so there's a lot of instructions called pop, uh, pop along. Uh, and what that's doing is it is taking something from the stack, um, which, which is a region of memory and it's putting them back into memory, or back into registers, excuse me. So EBX, ECX, EDX, ESI, EDI. These are registers. These are those local variables in kernel state. So we're returning them from, we've saved them out to memory. We've done our kernel program. And at the very end, we're going to take the things that were the state of the CPU back when the user program was running it. We're going to put them back into these registers. So now the CPU is getting closer back to where it was. Uh, we're going to restore the stack pointer uh, is what this add L4 to the stack pointer is doing. So that's adding four back to where the stack is. So we're, we're setting the stack uh, after we pop it. So, and finally, uh, we do this thing called IRET. Uh, and IRET is a, again, a hardware specific instruction that is an interrupt return. And it will not only return to where the program counter tells it the last function was, which will be back to the user code, but it will also decrease permissions. It'll it'll de-escalate back to user permissions from the escalated interrupt handler permission world. Okay, so we are returning control to the point of interruption by popping the uh, instruction pointer um, and the stack and, and the various flags. And then we're continuing its execution from where the user code left off. Um, we have the CPU exception interrupt or return to the instruction that causes it um, because the thing that we put on the stack uh, is the address of the instruction that triggered uh, the the interrupt so cool so one of the things to think about so we've got this mechanism uh, I need something like opening a file I trigger an interrupt we're now in an interrupt handler that sees, oh, this is actually a request from a process to open a file. I'm gonna do some work and then I'm gonna return. One of the overlying questions that comes up a lot in designing system calls and designing this interface is where does the work happen? Uh, and in particular, there's this concept that the interrupt handler uh, needs to happen relatively quickly. Um, for complexity, it would be problematic for the interrupt handler to have another interrupt happen during it. And so if you're doing a lot of work during that interrupt, uh, you really would like to have that sort of happen as one unit and not take too long. And so if you've got anything that needs to take a lot of work, so uh, I'm reading data uh, from a hard drive and that may take a lot of instructions, right? A hard drive is slow compared to a CPU, right? A CPU, is doing a billion instructions per second or more, right? A gigahertz processor, that means it's it's doing a billion operations per second. The CP, the, the hard drive may take 10 milliseconds to read a byte. 
the first bite, right? So, so as it seeks, it spins this platter around. That platter is spinning, right, uh, 5,000, 7,000 times a second, right? This is the RPM on a hard drive. So a faster hard drive has a higher RPM. But that RPM, that rotations, uh, revolutions, is 5,000, 7,000, uh, up to 10 or 15,000. But that still means that as you wait for that hard drive platter to, to go around, you're waiting up to 10, 15 milliseconds. And so your CPU should be doing a million things or more during that time. And so you'd really not, you'd really like to not block. You, you don't want your CPU to just sort of wait for the hard drive to come around, but rather you'd like to have it tell the disk, hey, I'd like the information in that position, whatever. And then sometime later, have that information. But the CPU should go off and be able to do other things during that time. And so it's that same concept that we don't want to be blocking and waiting for something that takes a while to happen in an interrupt handler because we want to be able to do other useful work during that time. That we'd like to figure out how during an interrupt handler uh, to do very few things. And so often what you'll see during the interrupt handler is I'm going to put the request on some queue in memory and that's all I'm going to do. And there will be some other task that happens that does the actual work asynchronously, not during the interrupt itself. Uh, and so uh, that that is, is sort of the underlying philosophy for the design structure for a lot of these interrupts and why there might be this additional complexity, uh, is that during an interrupt, uh, you'd really like that to be as few instructions as possible and, and ideally to not have to worry about uh, the occurrences where one interrupt gets preempted by some other interrupt um, because suddenly that complexity spirals and, and you've got a lot of you know potential for oh I, I sent this message to my device and I was expecting to send these two you know this whole message all at once but I sent half of it and then some other interrupt happened and so there was this pause and the device got confused and the next half of it got interpreted weird because the device didn't realize that there might be a pause uh, and so your complexity just goes up a lot and the potential for bugs goes up a lot. Okay, so that, that, that's one of the things that sort of gets worried about or gets used as a design pattern through a lot of this. Okay, so we've talked about user mode versus kernel mode in, in, uh, in passing, uh, but I haven't defined that yet. Um, and so this also gets called dual mode execution. The, there's two modes, there's user and kernel. The kernel is this lower, more powerful mode and, and you've got user mode that can't do things. Um, when we think about how we sort of separate these permissions, you've got a couple things that are happening here. We've got a principle of least privilege. So you'd like things to run with as little privileges as they can. And so this is the philosophy behind why you would have user mode is I don't need my, my application program to be able to do everything. And so I would like to run it in a less privileged way um, so that it can't be, because I don't expect it in normal mode to be shutting down my computer. It would be great if this whole large swath of code that is my application code, if there's bugs in any of it, I know at least that my computer is not getting shut down, right? That, that, that's the thing that I get out of principle of least privilege. And that's the important thing, right, is, is that you've got that. So the next piece when we think about layering beyond least privilege is that we need to consider a unit of execution. Uh, and so this is what the process model is in some sense, is that the, the sort of standardized view of, of how we separate these different privileges is at the level of a process. A process is sort of a self-contained, isolated piece of execution. It sees its own memory and so forth um, and is the way that the kernel is going to manage these different things that are executing with potentially different privileges. There's a few other units that, that come into play. So things like users. Um, and this uh, has evolved over time, right? Again, referring to that first lecture where we were talking about how in the 80s we had one computer with a lot of users versus today where we've got one user with a lot of computers. So, so the 
ability for a operating system to be managing the permissions of different users uh, has has changed a little bit. Our, our main sense now is that we're protecting different processes and maybe different origins. And so an origin here is this concept of uh, a software developer. So the, the code that Photoshop, that Adobe Photoshop uses, maybe can talk to other Adobe products like Adobe Illustrator, right? And, and so that's all one developer. And so there's some way for that developer to send messages uh, more freely between their different applications rather than being able to mess with my web browser or some other unrelated application. So there's a few different ways, principles, actors, uh, different ways to think about, uh, you know, how to split up ownership. Uh, and, and so that, that comes into play here as well in terms of how we're going to design our kernel permissions. Uh, finally, the, the other thing that comes into layering is you've got this split between uh, your ability to be expressive in uh, your in the way that you are expressing what things can do what versus how quickly you're doing them, how many checks you're having to do, right? So I could have this very complex model where I define exactly what system calls each process is allowed to uh, operate on. Uh, but that means now that there's like a, some list for every process and the uh, operating system as it gets a call is going to have to find the right list and go into that list and figure that out. And that seems like a bunch more overhead uh, than for instance, well, all applications can do this less thing. And so I just have a single list uh, and I know exactly what I should be checking directly. Uh, so there, there's a balance here uh, in terms of how uh, fine grained and, and what level you can specify things about your privilege. Uh, and, and in comparison, uh, you know, how much complexity you're introducing. This model that we've talked about, uh, that Linux is using, that that Windows is basically using um, is, is sort of a fairly standard kernel module or setup uh, and gets used by many of the operating systems that we are going to be interacting with and, and that you are familiar with. Uh, however, it is not the only model uh, for how to think about separating things that, that exists. Uh, and so it's worth sort of stepping back a little bit and talking about some of the others. Um, so there's there's a concept called a microkernel, which is saying let's let's take this this operating system kernel and make it as small as possible, right? Um, as you've split your kernel mode and application mode, one of the things you've done is you said, well, all of that code that's happening in the kernel is now privileged, and so if there's bugs in any of that code, that potentially compromises this computer. It means that an application could find a bug in any of that stuff and find some way to trigger it uh, in order to mess up the computer to, you know, be able to start executing code uh, with full permissions. So a micro code kernel is saying instead, what is the smallest number of things that we can have happen in the kernel? And what things that have been happening in the kernel can we push up and make other processes? Can we move into processes? Uh, and so it moves things like the file system uh, and, and uh, some of the memory management even up into processes. Uh, and so if I want to interact with the file system, now rather than making a system call to the kernel, I instead make a process, an inner process call over to another, to the file system process, which, which manages some, the file system for me. Uh, in contrast, you've got uh, some experimental operating systems that are written as unikernels. Uh, in a unikernel, uh, essentially what you're saying is everything happens in the kernel. There is none of this permission stuff. Uh, there's just a single, we're always executing with full permissions. Uh, and so this gets used for uh, some smaller embedded uh, things where you don't want the overhead and don't want to think about multiple processes in the same way. Uh, it also gets used uh, sometimes where you might have a specific task and you will uh, at compilation time. So I've got my program. I know exactly the things I need for my web server or for a specific task. And I will code just that. Uh, and so I'll have a much more limited computing base, but that computing base then just becomes a unit kernel. Uh, finally, uh, and, and this looks in many ways similar to a microkernel, uh, but there's this specific name given called exokernel, uh, right? And so this, this sounds maybe a little like exoskeleton, the skeleton on the outside. And so an exokernel is saying that application processes now are granted the ability to directly interact with some hardware resources. So, uh, 
the way I described the, the microkernel, where the file system is now a process, right? So my, my application now is talking over to the file system process. Well, now this file system process is also able to directly interact with the hard drive. Uh, that that is not mediated uh, by the kernel. And so we're actually now increasing the privilege of these, of these user processes in some specific, uh, maybe limited fashion so that uh, some processes can directly interact with the hardware. This gets used as a performance uh, enhancement of some sense, which is, you know, in particular with network uh, access, you might not want every network packet to come into the kernel and then up to my process. I might want my process to be able to directly interact with the network uh, so that there's less context switching, less of these system calls happening. Okay. And, and, and maybe one of the other things that's relevant to talk about here is that we, we talked about sort of the speed, how long operations take, and that, that, that's maybe one of the things that's relevant here. Um, the cost of a system call is non-zero. It's more than a function call. Um, how much expense, more expensive it is has depended uh, per platform, per period. Some CPUs were better at this. Sometimes we've optimized this more. Um, but you should think about it as maybe between 100 and 400 normal instructions. So I can do 400 additions in the time that I can make a system call or return from a system call. The, these are relatively expensive instructions. Uh, because we're uh, taking all of my context state and we're storing that for a little bit and then we're restoring it. So this context switch, uh, both across memory, uh, right? Suddenly I'm in kernel space, I have a different memory that I'm uh, going to need the CPU to have access to, uh, and, and uh, also the state. Uh, all of that sort of switch uh, is a non-zero cost uh, operation, and so these end up being somewhat expensive. Uh, and so that is a reason why you would in some high performance things especially, want to directly be able to interact with hardware without having to switch back and forth between the kernel and the program. Uh, x86 has a ringed metaphor for how you're executing. Ring zero is what the kernel runs in. That's the, the highest permission. All, all of the various CPU uh, calls are enabled. Uh, ring three is user mode. Uh, which is the the lower permission uh, and and many of the you know specific uh, interactions with external devices interaction of changing the CPU itself uh, and its modes are disabled while while in the lower uh, constrained ring three mode. Uh, so it actually has a, a four ring four modes. There's there's two bits right, and they can you know two bits means there's four different possibilities. Windows, Mac, Linux typically are only using Ring 0 and Ring 3. Um, in the early days of hardware virtualization, so uh, this is, um, you would be running a virtual machine of another operating system in yours. Um, I'd say this was, we're talking nine, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, you had an era where um, many desktop CPUs did not have uh, a, an extension called hardware virtualization. Uh, so this is Intel VTX, um, but, but there's a couple different names that have happened. Uh, and so the, the first round of emulators of these things that were letting you do a virtual machine of, of running one operating system inside of another operating system, uh, the way that they would do that virtualization is they would run the guest, the, the inside operating system that they're emulating uh, at ring one. Uh, and so this, this additional uh, ringed tier uh, was made use of where programs running in the guest, when they had an interrupt, it would get handled by ring one. And when that operating system tried to do something that it wasn't allowed to do, that would get handled by the host that was, uh, you know, the external operating system that was running the virtual machine. Cool. Um, so I'm going to pause here and we will switch over to the second video.